Good, perfect. Well, thank you very much for having me. I'm so excited to come back here. I know you guys are super excited to talk about business, but I'm going to make it really engaging. Feel free to ask questions if you want. Um, I want this to be a great learning experience for you because just because um, some are going into neuro doesn't mean that you can't open a cash-based clinic. I help mentor some neuro PTs who have a cash-based physiology practice. Some people are doing geriatrics, even peds clinics. So this isn't just an outpatient ortho thing anymore. That if you create real value to in the public size, that you could do a neuro clinic, a peds clinic, a geriatric clinic. And I think that we really need to adapt as physical therapists going forward so we kind of thrive in a cash-based setting, in a hybrid setting, whatever. So if anyone has any questions, feel free to ask. Um, we'll probably lecture for maybe like 45 minutes then we'll kind of uh, sit back, ask some questions. Um, I want to make sure this is a good learning experience for you. For you. So um, I, brick, I broke this up into two different kind of parts. Um, the first part's, you know, kind of going over the current healthcare market and how I believe a cash-based physical therapy practice can thrive. Um, and then the second half, it's going to be like the fundamentals of a cash practice, you know, business, marketing, sales, and stuff like that. We'll definitely have plenty of time to go over the healthcare market and a cash-based practice and why I believe it's gonna thrive. And my clinic this year is about to generate over 300,000 sales, 100% cash. So it works. You just have to know how to do it. And um, I'll be able to go over some basic, you know, sales stuff and marketing stuff if anyone has any questions. Um, so I recently interviewed um, Jim Milton. He was the former CEO of Life Enhancing Therapies. And he's retired, he's out in Colorado now. And I, my father-in-law met him on, on a trip and he gave me an hour of his time and I got to interview him. And uh, he's done and retired and he sold his clinics, but he made this, this statement. If you knew PTs don't stay proactive and adapt, you're gonna get crushed. And that's so true. So and that's why I'm doing this stuff to help other PTs, um, you know, really get paid for the value that we bring, okay? And so we all get to open up clinics. We all get to be financially stable and live the lives that we want to do. So let's go over my story. So originally, I'm from Harrisburg, Pennsylvania. I did my undergrad at a small Division II school out by Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania. It's called Indiana University of Pennsylvania. And I got an undergrad degree. What's that? I usually party. Yeah, I, we were... In Playboy magazine, we were ranked in like the number one party school back in the day. So, <laughs> um, a lot of people party there. And uh, when I finished my undergrad, I was like athletic training slash pre med with a minor in chemistry. I didn't. I knew I wanted to go into more school. So I graduated. I was like, you know what? If I'm going to go anywhere, I'm going down south where it's warm. So I applied to every PT school from UNC Chapel Hill all the way down to Miami, Florida, and I got denied in every one. The only reason why I got into Carolina is because one of my professors wrote a letter of recommendation who she knew the dean of the school here and said I was in the top 1% to ever come out of my school. And that's the only reason why I got in here. I had to take my GREs three times just to, for Bruce to let me in because my English scores were so low. <laughs> so he was like, Ron, I really want you in the program. You got to take your GREs again. I literally took the GREs three times just to get in. So I packed up everything. I got in and I moved down here. Um, I did my dissertation with Dr. Beatty. Um, I felt that I was, I hated the spine and I was weak at it, so I figured I'd put myself with him and get better at it. So I ended up graduating in 2008, and I felt like I got recruited by this one company in Savannah, Georgia. So me and another colleague of mine who also graduated from here um, ended up moving to Savannah, Georgia and worked in an outpatient insurance clinic. It was the same old, same old. It was our first job. We were excited, we loved being in, in the Savannah. Typical insurance clinic, you're seeing two, three or four patients an hour. You know, you're getting overworked and underpaid, you're just billing, billing the insurance out the wazoo. So we were like, there has to be something better. So I had the opportunity to move to Florida and do an orthopedic residency. You know, I was like, you know what, I'm thinking about going into private practice, I need to get good quick. So my roommate ended up coming back here and doing a PhD and I ended up going down to Florida and doing an orthopedic residency at Florida Hospital. Um, I loved Florida down there. It was great. Um, finished, finished the residency. And I took a pay cut to actually do the residency. Because um, after the residency, I, a, I have my OCS. I have two publications underneath my belt. I have physicians referring to me. I'm doing great. And they look at me like, well, Ron, you're not going to get a pay raise. 
you're not going to get this, you're not going to get that. I was like, well, I can't work here anymore. I was like, I already took a pay cut to work there, so I'm not going to, you know, I'm trying to do big things. So I actually quit. And I was presenting a poster at CSM. This is in New Orleans. And the director of rehab came up to me. He was like, Ron, why'd you quit? And I was like, honestly, the average reimbursement per visit is $75. And you're asking me to see two to three patients an hour. So I'm bringing over $200 an hour. And you're going to pay me like $35. I was like, I can't do that. So he asked me to come back as a PRN rate. I was already planning out Pursuit, which, which is my company now. Whenever I say Pursuit, that's my company, Pursuit Physical Therapy. And uh, I ended up working there for like another year. They asked me to come back, and I started planning, planning out Pursuit because I was like, I think I'm going to open a cash-based clinic. And I was like, well, are people even going to pay cash for PT? I was like, this is a new thing. I never even thought about this. And so I started making my plans, and then I jumped off the cliff of small business. I literally went cold turkey. I quit my job, started my business, and I started working uh, peer rent at a nursing facility just to pay the bills. And you know, I started what 2013, and now I'm in my fifth year. I have two PTs that are on staff. I have a front desk that I call my concierge specialist. She makes her sure that the patients are taken care of, gives them an unbelievable experience. And I'm looking to hire a fourth PT, more of a sport one right now, and we're gonna probably break 300,000 in all cash sales this year. And uh, we're growing business, and Jim's business is doing awesome too right now. He's more of a hybrid clinic, but you know, a cash-based practice can work. And there's a lot of PTs now that are starting this and doing it and making things work. So that's my story, just to catch you up. Um, my ultimate goal, my professional goal, I, I would love to be a fellow of AOMP. So once my clinic starts to grow, um, I would love to do a fellowship in manual therapy. So I'm known internationally as a fellow of AOMP. Okay, so that's my personal goal. But first, I've got to make my clinic automated so I don't have to be there. And then I can go do a fellowship. Okay. So I operate by the KISS principle, okay? So I like to keep it simple, stupid, okay? I don't like to make things complicated. I'm gonna keep it really basic and easy. Basic concepts so you guys get it. You guys can ask, ask questions. There's no, thing, there's no reason to make things complicated, okay? So who right now is actually interested in a cash-based practice? Is anyone interested in cash-based physical therapy? Okay. So. What I like to do is kind of make it engaging and see what other successful people are, are saying. So Mark Zuckerberg, the, the owner of Facebook, okay, if you're going to start a business, um, you have to really look at what is the problem that you're solving in the world, okay? What problem are we solving as physical therapists? You know, let's just keep it simple, okay? In business, you need to understand and solve the problem or create a new, a new idea. Okay, especially when you're doing physical therapy, which is already an insurance-based model and the public has a negative mindset on it. So what problem are we really solving? <clears throat> okay, you know, Uber, Uber's, this is, I've Ubered my whole trip here in Savannah and Charleston. Uber is an awesome, awesome new idea that solves simple problems that no one wants a taxi anymore. Okay, Amazon, who doesn't shop on Amazon anymore? The easy, the delivery, the no shipping, okay? These are companies that are solving problems. Airbnb is dis disrupting the hotel industry because, you know, they're solving problems that the public wants, okay? What about Yeti? I think Yeti's the best invention since the iPad. Who doesn't like a Yeti anymore to sit out on the beach and your drink stays cold for hours, okay? S simple problems, the scrub daddy. This is a simple, this is one of the best inventions on Shark Tank, and it's a freaking sponge. Okay, simple problems, okay? Um, Netflix, at Tesla, these are all companies that are solving s simple problems here. Now, what problems are we solving in physical therapy, okay? We could do this whole lecture on the problems in healthcare, okay? Whether it's Obamacare, whether it's just healthcare in general, okay, it is a dysfunctional system, and healthcare needs the reset button. Okay, so let's look at, you know, f physical therapists have a tendency just to look at healthcare through the eyes of a physical therapist. But let's take a step back and kind of look at what problems are we going to solve as a physical therapist in healthcare. 
okay? And we can divide this into three basic categories, the system, the clinician, and the patient, okay? With healthcare economics and insurance companies, what problems can we help with in a cash-based setting? How about the clinicians? You guys are going towards your you know, second to last or last clinicals probably soon. You guys has experienced some problems within the clinic. But us as clinicians, what problems do we have to deal with that a cash-based practice can solve? How about the patient? Let's look at healthcare through the eyes of a patient. Has anyone been a patient before? So if you go through the patient experience, most of the time it's absolutely horrible. Like my wife recently just got diagnosed with MS. So I went through the whole patient experience as a patient and it was horrible. I'm sitting there, I'm like, this is ridiculous. Like this is a horrible experience. Why would I ever, ever want to come back? Okay, so let's view it from the eyes of a patient and solve some problems because these, this is our consumer going forward. So we definitely want to solve that. So whether you realize it or not, this is a dysfunctional relationship, okay, between the insurance companies, the clinician, and the patient. There's so much dysfunction. And it's not just healthcare. You know, any insurance, you know, whether it's homeowner's insurance, whether it's disability insurance, health insurance, they're your best friend when they're trying to sell you on a certain kind of plan, but whenever it's time that you need them, or you have to submit a claim, they're like, oh, well, hold on for a second. We don't, we don't really cover that. If your house gets damaged by a hurricane, they're like, whoa, hold on, we're going to give you 70000 when it costs 150 Okay, so there's a lot of dysfunction in the health insurance, homeowner's insurance, disability insurance thing in, in general. But regarding health insurance, there is a huge dysfunction here with the patients not knowing their health insurance plans or knowing what a co-insurance is or, or a copay. The health insurance company is always trying to say no and to decrease their expenses as, as much as possible. And the clinician, if you work in an insurance-based clinic, you're forced to see more and more patients and to bill more and more. I'll never forget this. The day that, there's two things that happened the day that I knew that I wanted to go cash. One, I was treating a patient with manual therapy here. I had, a, I had my second patient right here doing exercises. I knew I could have helped this patient who I'm working on and my third patient comes walking in. I'm like, that has to be a better way. And then one of my old, old bosses, so I was doing great. I was showing awesome outcomes. Physicians were sending me patients and I was getting patients better at 2.5 units a visit. And my boss was like, Ron, you had to start charging four units a visit. I was like, no, I don't think so. <laughs> Cause I'm not gonna just keep people around when you're asking me to see two or three patients an hour. So those two things, you know, I knew that I had to do something better, okay? So as a clinician, we're forced to build more and more and see more and more patients, but yet they're gonna pay us less. Okay, so this is a huge dysfunctional relationship between the, these three things. And it's sad to say, but the person that gets the low end of the totem pole or the, or the bottom of the stick is the patient. The patient's the one that gets screwed at the end. So what are some basic problems in healthcare right now? We could spend this whole lecture on this alone, okay? But the number one thing, whether you support Obamacare or whether you do something else, the number one thing that needs to be solved is the overinflated cost of healthcare, okay? We all probably agree on that. And until someone solves that problem, there's always gonna be a problem in healthcare. If an eval costs $100, but you can go to a hospital system and they can bill 500 for that, that's, that's a problem, okay? If, um, and then say the patient has a $5,000 deductible. Guess who has to pay $500 for that eval that really only costs 100, okay? I've been, we had to go to the ER a couple times. And just to go to the ER, it's $1,000. We even went to the ER and they sent us home and they still tried to bill us for a $1,000 ER fee plus the physician, they tried to sneak in a physician bill. So it cost us $1,500 just to go to the ER, but they sent us home and they still try to get money from us. So um, the increase, the overinflated cost of healthcare is a huge problem that someone needs to solve. Whether it's Trump, whether it's Obamacare, whether it's the next president, anyone. Until that problem's solved, healthcare is gonna always have a huge problem, okay? It's a horrible business model. And what business model do you do the service but not get paid until two or three months later? You know, why not do the service and get paid for it at the same time? And then there's such a huge 
dis disconnect. You know, reimbursement, I bill $100, you may only get $70 or $30 for whatever services you provided. Who wants to go into business in that type of model? Why not do the service, get paid for 100 and you bill 100 okay? In the U.S., we have increased disease rates. There's an increased need uh, for services, whether it's physician assistants, you know, PTs, et cetera. There's an increased need for services. Another problem is how, how do we cover the poor, okay? And the Medicare system is broken with the baby boomers coming in. I mean, it's, it's kind of simple. You know, if the money coming in is less than the money going out, it's not going to hold up too much longer, okay? And this year, I think, in March, was the first time Social Security had to dip into its reserves. So all of us, we're not going to get Social Security going forward, okay? Medicare is, is going to go bankrupt. It's just a matter of time. When the expenses outweigh the income coming in, it's a no-brainer. It's kind of simple, okay? So th these are some problems in healthcare that need to be solved. So what kind of problems do we go through as a provider or a clinician? So declining reimbursement. This isn't just physical therapy either. Physicians are dealing with this too. You know, OTs are dealing with this too. Anyone who goes through insurance, insurance is reimbursing less and less, okay? Productivity standards. We're forced to see two to three to four patients an hour in an outpatient clinic, okay? Um, there's too many un unnecessary procedures. Why do people for an acute ankle sprain need to go through um, everyone needs an x-ray? Or you know, why do you need to waste uh, money on imaging for acute bouts of lower back pain? Um, when we went to the ER for my wife's diagnosis, all we wanted was an MRI, you know, from, from your neuro classes. The, you know, the gold standard to diagnose MS is, you know, cerebral spinal fluid with a lumbar puncture. You look at some, uh, some of the spinal fluid work, and then you do an MRI with a dissemination in time and space over a period of time to confirm an MS diagnosis, which is, I think is 88% sensitive and 80% specific. So, um, and they wanted to try to force us to go get a CT scan. We're like, no, all we need is an MRI. And I don't care, I'll pay out of pocket for the services. But they tried to bump up our bill more, saying it's hospital policy to do a CT scan first. So then we were like, no, we just need an MRI, so they sent us home. And we went to an image center later. So too many unnecessary procedures that bump up the cost of care, okay? Just like that, my, my old employer said, we want you to start billing f four units of visit instead of two and a half. Um, insurance is gui guiding and dictating treatment, okay? Half the time, whenever you have to pre-authorize something, you're pre-authorizing with a nurse that has no clue about physical therapy. But they're just going to say, hey, we approve six visits or ten visits. But there's no reasoning for it. Um, avoid harm and poor outcomes. Medical errors is like the third leading cause of death in the U.S. still. I don't even understand how that's even going on still. How is medical errors the third leading, leading cause, of, cause of death? So that's a huge problem. There's an increase um, expenses and cost of care. We've already gone over that. And the lack of cost-effective treatments. You know, um, how come I was able to get patients better in two and a half units when everyone else in my clinic was doing four? Or better yet, um, I can charge the average cost of care at Pursuit Physical Therapy is $816 for lower back pain when the U.S. average is $1,800 to $6,600. And I'm actually publishing my research in my first three years now in a medical journal to help promote this now. But we're lacking cost-effective treatments. You guys have all heard about this stuff. This is evidence-based practice. What are the patients saying, okay? Because if we're going to market directly to the patients in a private, in a small business or a private practice, what are the patients saying? And if we can solve these problems, they're going to want, want to come to us, okay? They're saying... Health insurance co costs too much. The cost of health care is too much. My deductible is too high. Uh, my doctor doesn't take, doesn't take my insurance. Um, there's, long, th there's long waiting periods. Who wants to wait two weeks and be in pain for two weeks and not be treated by that? Why not get them in sooner? Who wants to wait uh, months to be seen by a specialist? You know, who wants to go to your appointment when it's 11 o'clock but they don't get seen until 12.30? That's a problem that patients are complaining about. A lot of patients say, I don't want to be seen 
in a, in a factory setting, okay? If you were the patient and you had to pay a $70 copay, but yet you were seen with two or three other patients, how does that make, how does that make you feel, okay? Insurance clinics are having a hard time keeping patients because the deductibles, I mean, the copays are going up, but they're not seeing value. Like, I'm just doing some exercises that I can do at home, and I'm paying you guys $75 to watch me do exercises or to put me with someone else. So there's a huge problem with insurance clinics retaining patients because they're not showing value, you know, especially if copays are going up. What are my patients saying that I hear in a cash-based clinic? This is what I hear. The doctor only saw me for five, for five minutes. He walked in and said, okay, uh, are you getting PT injections or surgery? Did it, okay, here you go. PT injection surgery, PT injection surgery. You know, if you ever have the opportunity to show a uh, shadow an outpatient ortho, you know, physician, you'll see how, how many patients they have to see per hour. They're going through the same problems we are, okay? The doctor only saw me for five minutes. The doctor eval didn't even touch me. He just asked me some questions and sent me on the way and told me that I needed surgery. Um, I was triple booked with other patients. The treatment did not help. My physician just wanted to do surgery, okay? Um, there's so many times where it's acute back pain or um, meniscus tear that, you know, if you go to a surgeon, they're probably going to want to do surgery. But maybe that's not the best for the actual patient, okay? I see it all the time. I had three injections, which I don't know why you would do the third one if the first two didn't, didn't work, but I've had three injections and I still have my same pain. Okay, they, they just told me to stop doing CrossFit. They just told me, oh, I love to run, S stop running, okay? I've heard there was a, I had a teenage boy once come in with a diagnosis of knee arthritis from, from running. And he was so scared and the parents were so scared. I was like, no, I didn't even look at the imaging and I got him back to running. I mean, you see this, this type of stuff all the time, okay? And I see my PT was nice, but they just had me do exercises that didn't help and I can do at home, okay? So the big problem with healthcare is how can we deliver high quality healthcare to all Americans at a affordable price, okay? Now what has to change? We have to change into a effective model. We need to decrease the cost of healthcare. Hospitals and clinics need to reduce the overall costs and expenses. That's one of the biggest problems that I see in practices in general. Their expenses are way, way too high, okay? Healthcare providers have to reduce the cost per, per patient, okay? Clinicians need to be more innovative and cost effective of how care is given, okay? So what problems can a cash-based clinic solve? Okay, it, with insurance, we can decrease the cost of care. I'm publishing my three-year data right now. The average cost of care in low back pain was $816 compared to the national average of 1800 or 1600 to $6,600, that's huge cost savings there, okay? A cash based system is based on outcomes and results because if you don't show outcomes, they're not gonna pay you cash for this, okay? So it's outcome driven, okay? Um, as a clinician, you can maintain one-on-one -on -one patient care. What is best for the patient will dictate treatment, not insurance companies, not me just trying to get four or five units a visit. What, the patient, what is best for them will dictate care. Um, for the patient, they get direct access and no waiting periods, okay? If someone calls Pursuit right now, I wanna get them in within that week. If someone comes in for an, an 11 o'clock appointment, they'll be seen at 11 o'clock, okay? No one wants to wait an hour and a half to be seen by someone, okay? Increased patient satisfaction and it's cheaper, okay? And, I already went over, I'm teaming up with the University of Central Florida to publish my first three years of data. There's one study that's been done in the 70s and 80s that looked at the health insurance experiment, um, pretty much kind of just showing that when someone is more responsible for the cost of their care, that the cost per care goes down, the over utilization of care starts to go down and outcomes show no change. But there is an older study done on that with uh, health insurance plans, different models and a cash or an out-of-pocket model. And it actually showed that um, cost of care went down, the use of services went down and the outcomes were still the same. So if, if you wanted to start a business in a free market, okay, I like this quote by Tony Robbins, um, businesses succeed in a free market by providing a product or a service that others want and it meets the needs of others, okay? 
So what do our patients want and what do our patients need? Okay. So I'm sure the person who created the private school system said that same thing. And everyone's like, what? You're going to ask people to pay for school when it's free? But there's, many, there's plenty of private schools out there that are succeeding and thriving. Okay. The scrub daddy met the needs and wants of the public. People are willing to pay $3 for a sponge with a happy face on. Okay, and I even buy mine in bulk. I pay $29 for three or four sleeves of them and buy them in bulk because I know I can get them at two sixty dollars a piece. Okay, but the scrub daddy is meaning the needs. People wanted a better sponge to wash their dishes with. You know, Yeti. Okay, people wanted a drink that, you know, something that kept their coffee hot or, a, or dr something that kept their drinks cold. Okay, we're meeting the needs and wants of the public. Okay. Some things that need to start changing, I bet you if cable TV doesn't start adapting to what the people want, um, they're going to go out of business and it's all going to be YouTube TV, Hulu and, and everything else because I don't want to watch these commercials. I don't need 350 channels when I only, need, when I, when I only watch 20, okay? Um, if cable TV doesn't start to adapt and change, they're going to go out of business or they're going to have to adapt to the times. The education system. You know, uh, if the education system doesn't start th doesn't start adapting, you know, there's going to be a, a huge decrease of people going to school because they're going to go into trade and more skill sets. Or con con university teaches people for free. Okay, is there a more cost effective way to educate people in this period? I think Elon Musk created his own school where he has him, his kids, and a bunch of other kids are going there because he feels that he can educate kids better. Look at the charter school system. You know, why are students doing better in charter schools than public schools, especially in Florida at least? Um, you know, so if education doesn't start adapting, you know, that's going to be a problem. Someone's going to come and do it better. Standard PT <coughs> clinics. Most standard clinics are about one Medicare cut from going under. Okay, so there, you know, there's these huge companies now are coming in and buying out all, all these PT clinics because the profits are so small with each clinic that they're just trying to get strength in numbers now. They want to own like 50 clinics so they show decent amounts of profit. But most outpatient clinics are struggling to get by and their expenses match their revenue. So they're barely making ends meet. Most clinics are probably one Medicare cut from going under or downsizing, okay? So what do our prospective patients need and want? What do they need? They need a decreased cost of care. They need easy access. They need successful outcomes, okay? They need evidence-based practice and proven treatment approaches, okay? No one's going to pay you cash to ultrasound, stem, and stretch, stretch them. You need to start solving the root cause of their problem, implement interventions that are going to get them better and th then they'll be willing to pay you cash to come and see, okay? This is exactly what they need. It's pretty simple, okay? What do they want? They want a great patient experience. They don't want to wait hours to be seen. They want to see their specialist. They want to see the PT. They don't want to see a tech. They don't want to be double and triple booked with other people. They want to see the best. If someone's going to pay you cash, they're going to want to see the best. Okay? They want to get pain free. They want faster results and fewer visits. They want it at a lower cost. They want one on one patient care and they want to be heard and make sure that they're cared for. They don't want to feel like they're in a factory. They don't want to see a different therapist every single time. It's pretty simple. In a cash based clinic, can we actually meet that? I think we can. So if you want to open up a business and you want to be successful, it kind of helps to know where you're going. There's a power of prediction. Just like with physical therapy, there's power with prognosis. If I do an eval and I can identify these factors, I can, you know, have research that supports this that, hey, this shows a good outcome if you present with X, X, Y, Z. Like McKenzie stuff for lower back pain with uh, radiculopathy. If you can centralize that low back pain, we know it's a good prognosis that you'll respond to PT interventions. Okay, um, so there's a power, there's huge power with prognosis or prediction. I bet you if you had that Sporks Almanac from back, back to the future movies and stuff like that, you know, and you can go and gamble when you know the outcomes, that's, that's awesome, right? 
um, if you knew what the stock market was going to do within the next year, that's, that's some power there. Okay, so everyone has probably heard this Wayne Gretzky quote. If you don't know who he is, he's one of the greatest hockey players of all time. But someone asked him, asked him, you weren't the fastest player, you weren't the biggest player, and you're not the strongest player, but yet you're still considered one of the greatest hockey players of all time, and how? And he said, most players skate to where the puck is, I skate to where the puck is going. So the power of prognosis. <laughs> this is an old, old college story. So. I, I remember we're sitting around, this is an undergrad, and my, uh, this is a bunch of undergrad college guys hanging out, and my one old roommate's reading a Cosmopolitan, and we're like, dude, why are you reading a Cosmopolitan? And he was like, it's like reading the other team's playbook. Now I know exactly what girls are thinking so I can get more girls. <laughs> he was so stupid. <laughs> but, you know, he was reading a Cosmopolitan to know what girls are thinking so he can meet more girls. So I thought that was hilarious. <laughs> but he's taken advantage of prognosis and predictions. So what are five trends that we need to know in healthcare and in the future? Okay, especially for a cash-based physical therapy business. We need to know what's going on with the economy. We're in the service industry, okay? So what are some service industry trends? We're in healthcare. What does our marketplace look like, okay? And can we create true value? I'm not sure if you follow any other cash-based stuff, but everyone's always talking about value. You have to create value in the patient's eyes. And we're going to go over that. So the economic trends, okay? Peter Drunker, we're in the era of three C's. Accelerating change, increased complexity, increased competition. Eric Warrior, we are in the performance-based economy, okay? This is huge, the performance-based economy, and I'm going to go into that a little bit right now. What, is the new, what does the new economy mean, okay? The corporate era is done. Okay, you're not going to go to school, work for a company, get paid a salary with benefits, work for years, save, you can't retire, you work for more, and then you save more, and then you retire. That stuff's going to be gone, okay? And as you get out there into the workforce, you're going to have to see and recognize that you're going to be paid on performance, you're not going to be paid on hours worked anymore, okay? It's the performance economy. You are going to be paid for performance and results and not time. You're going to get paid lower salaries, lower base salaries, and you'll get additional income with reaching benchmarks, okay? So what's, what's an example of this? Say you have a house cleaning service for the hotel. Um, she's going to, or he, doesn't matter, whoever, is going to get paid for the number of rooms cleaned, not the hours worked. And if they reach their goal, and if they overshoot their goal, then they'll get paid more, okay? Um, it's kind of like the server model. Okay, servers get paid a low base salary and they're based off of how good their service is with tips. Okay, this is coming. So we all and you need to be aware of this, okay, going forward. Okay, they're going to be paying you based on the number of patients you treat and not your hours worked. Okay, why is this coming? Because it's a better business model for businesses. Okay, the new economy is going to need less, less people. A lot of jobs are going to be replaced by computers, okay? Um, there's better results and increased production with this model um, from a business standpoint. Um, you're going to see the exponential rise of technology. And this system is based on, on outcomes. I'm not going to pay someone just to do some stretching and range of motion and e-stim and ultrasound on people anymore because it's, it's not going to get results, okay? Um, this is going to come. so be aware of this and, and, and get ready for it because when people, when businesses, hospitals and people start realizing this, this is what's going to dictate your uh, salary. Okay? We're in technology in the era of mass info. Okay? Um, Gary Vaynerchuk's awesome. If you don't follow him online, he puts uh, some awesome, awesome content here. Um, and there's value there if those can bundle the right information and package it. That's kind of like what I'm doing with my cash-based physiotherapy.org stuff, okay? I'm giving everyone the blueprint to open up a cash-based practice and I'm proving it works. So if someone wants it, they can have my, my, my whole business model from business 101, marketing 101, the patient experience, sales, sales 101, okay? Um, Google doctor, everyone searches on 
Google nowadays. I think 90% of searches happen on Google. So um, you're going to start seeing patients, yeah, I Googled this and I tried some stretches, but it didn't work. Or I uh, Googled this, and better yet, they saw my content and they called me and came in for an eval. Okay, so you have to be on Google. Okay, the internet, telehealth, big data and data analysis, okay. Um, what can a cash-based practice do? It's great because the system's already based on outcomes because they're not going to pay you cash if you can't fix them or if you're not showing results. So the, ca you know, the cash-based model is going to solve that problem right there. We can take advantage of technology. Okay, right now I have pixels on my website pages for neck pain, back pain, and everything. I'm tracking data right now, whoever goes to, to my website, who's on my neck pain page. And from that pixel, I can launch a Facebook ad to everyone who went on my page marketing a neck pain program over the next two weeks based because I've been tracking that data on that pixel right now. Okay, and I can launch a marketing campaign just for neck pain. I can do the same thing for my running for my running injury program. Whoever visits that page, I can launch a Facebook ad to. Okay, I'm tracking data on my website right now. What are the five most common pages that people are going to? And, and what are the stats of conversions from that? Okay, so understanding what big data is. You know, it's the same thing right now. If you go s swipe your credit card at the Home Depot and you go check your email, you guys may not be going to the Home Depot right now, but <laughs> um, guess what pops up on my email? A, a Home Depot ad or a plan or a plot or a pot, like whatever I was looking at. Okay, so your credit cards are, are selling your data. Okay, if your cell phone right now is tracking your data, even texting. Texting isn't a secure, people are tracking your data right now, whether you know it or not. Okay, um, that's the future of advertising with Facebook, Google, your credit cards, everything. Okay, so um, understanding that in a cash-based practice and as physical therapists, we can take advantage of that. Poor, like magazines and local things are going to go out of business soon. You know, I'm not sure if you see this, but local magazines always call me, hey, we're going to feature this in the local golf. It's going to go to all these golfers and all this stuff. I'm like, no, I can just launch a Facebook ad for 200 bucks from Target golfers if I really want to. You know, I don't know how magazines are going to stay in business because no one wants to advertise with them anymore. I can pay a Google ad to, you know, search anyone searching Orlando hip, hip pain treatment and pop up in front of everyone who has hip pain. So there's better ways of doing it, and you have to understand this going into a uh, private practice. Service industry. What's the future of service industry for us? Because we are in the service industry. You can see that agriculture is going down. It's getting replaced by equipment and computers. Okay. You can look at manufacturing. Okay. You're getting replaced by uh, robots. Okay. But the service industry is going to grow. Okay. People still want to be taken care of by a human. Okay, um, I don't think that our job is in trouble of being replaced by a robot, but a personal trainer's is. Look at look at Peloton or that cycling company. You don't even need a person anymore. I'm waiting for the personal trainer to create an online database of exercise programs. Do it one time, monetize it, and people can log in from their home and do whatever workout they want. You don't need personal trainers anymore. You can do it by video. Acute care physical therapist, if someone can watch an educational video and stand up and walk around with a tech or with a PTA, we're in trouble for business because they don't need a PT anymore. I'm starting to see nursing facilities, acute care hospitals, they'll hire one PT and the rest PTAs because it costs them less. So we have to start doing something about that. Okay? Are we going to get replaced by computers? I doubt it. Primary care physicians may. They're already testing this. I think IBM Watson is running algorithms. If the algorithm based off of symptoms is more accurate than the primary care physician's diagnosis, guess what's going to happen to primary care physicians? So the person's going to walk in the clinic, get their blood pressure, their blood drawn, they're going to go up to this computer, type in their symptoms, da -da -da -da. you have a 70% chance of Lyme disease. Go to this in, in the internal medicine physician. You have the flu, take, take this pill now. Okay, so I think primary care physicians are in trouble. Now, some lobbyists and politics will probably prevent that, but you know, what's going to happen if you're going to get replaced by computers? I think we're fine on that. 
I don't think, but there's other businesses that are going to be struggling with that. Healthcare trends, you know, let's go over this really quick. Um, we already know this is a problem, the dysfunction between health insurance providers and patients. And, you know, there's a reason why no healthcare businesses are on Shark Tank, because it's a horrible business model. Okay, you ever wonder that? Like, this, if you're ever interested in going into business, watching Shark Tank or The Profit is an awesome, awesome TV show. It'll teach you so, so much about business, but there's a reason why they don't accept healthcare businesses on there, because it's a horrible model. Most people don't want to go into business in a healthcare um, platform. Um, what's going forward? You know, again, we can talk about the changes in healthcare. It's not going to be volume based before. It's the performance economy. It's going to be based off of value. Okay. Um, it's going to be you're going to be, be outcome based instead of service based. Okay. Better yet, you'll see this in bulk uh, charges now with some nursing facilities and hospitals where they just pay the ACO one check for the total knee replacement, and then from the anesthesiologist to the surgery to the rehab and everything is all up to that one check. But guess who's on the bottom of uh, the totem pole? Probably us. So maybe you're just stuck with two grand left to treat this total hip replacement. Okay. So we still have to watch this and make sure that we are um, part of this out outcome base. But um, the times are changing. It's a value-based system. It's part of the performance. Okay. Um, insurance companies. Okay, they're bumping up premiums, bumping up deductibles, bumping up co-pays, adding a co-insurance. 90% of patients don't know what a co-insurance is. <laughs> they have no clue. We have to educate them on that. Okay, and they're declining reimbursement. Okay, and, and kind of controlling what is actually covered. And the question is, <clears throat> where are we going to fit in the insurance company's eyes? Okay, I don't think the insurance, the insurance companies see value in what we do. We have the research to support it. We're cost effective. And I think that we've done it to ourselves, honestly. You can add into this too. I think we've done it to ourselves. We have no uh, money in packs. We have low membership. We don't stand up for us. It's, it's, it's getting better, but we've done it to ourselves, I think. Um, we're getting there. We're showing the outcomes. We're publishing the research. You know, membership in the APTs is starting to go up. We just reached. 30% in Florida, which is horrible, by the way. Chiropractors are 100%. Physicians are around 30, but they have lots of money. So we don't have any money to, you know, to give to lobbyists, to firms, to educate um, the politicians about what what we do. Okay, and we don't, you know, and insurance companies are doing the same thing. We're just a pawn on, on the the chessboard. But the question is, where are insurance companies going to value what we do? I think this is huge for physical therapy. Okay, it's a health saving accounts. A lot of businesses are buying high deductible healthcare plans, and health insurance is only going to be used for catastrophic events. Okay, and people, the public, are going to be more responsible for paying out of pocket for services provided. This is huge for a cash based clinic. I see a lot of people who have five thousand dollar deductibles. I see, you know, and that creates a huge market there. If you have a $5,000 deductible and you have chronic back pain, are you, are you going to go to the hospital and they're going to waste your money with the MRIs and imaging and get five evals for the same back pain and then get seen three times a week for four weeks? Or are you going go to go to a chiropractor for $4,000 and get seen twice a week for eight months? Or are you going to go to Pursuit Physical Therapy where I can get you better for $2,400 in two months? Okay, so there's cost effectiveness. There's a market to tap into this. This is huge for us. Okay, because if the patient has to pay out of pocket, we can get them better faster for cheaper. Future trends in healthcare, you know, ACOs um, are going to start dominating local markets. It's happening a lot here in, uh, in uh, Orlando. Is it happening here at all? Yeah. So there's huge companies coming in and buying out physician offices, they're buying out clinics. And uh, they're dominating, they're dominating the market. Okay, and I don't think the physical therapist is going to be seen as a direct primary care, um, controlling care of patients for musculoskeletal injuries. We're going to be on the bottom of the chessboard on this. Okay, but what can a cash-based physical therapy practice answer with this trend? We're going to 
decrease the cost of care again, we'll have direct access, we'll create real value in the patient's eyes, it's outcome based, and it's cost effective. And like another example is for plantar fasciitis. When I first started my practice, I was like, okay, what's, it, what's a group of people that really get injured a lot that want to get better? Runners. Okay, what's a diagnosis that's mistreated a lot? Plantar fasciitis. So I started marketing a uh, plantar fasciitis program to uh, runners. And it's the same model. If the patient's responsible for you know, a four or $7,000 deductible, you know, and you start comparing brand X, brand Y, brand, brand Z, the patient has to make a decision. Who am I gonna go to now because I have to pay this out of pocket? And there's real value in that in a cash-based practice. So the question is, are you skating to where the puck is or where it's going, okay? We need to be aware of future trends so we prepare ourselves for the future and not skate to where the puck's going right now, okay? What's the, market, what's the marketplace trend? Okay, so for those who don't really know, you know, say if you're looking in the physical therapy market, most people just look at all the physical therapists around Columbia, okay? That's the physical therapy market, okay? If you're looking at restaurants, you know, that's the, you know, in a 10 mile radius around, or uh, like around Columbia, that's the um, restaurant market, okay? If you're looking at uh, beverages, you know, the Coca-Cola, Pepsi, and stuff like that, that's the beverage market, whenever I say about market. Okay, so healthcare is an oversaturated marketplace. There are, there's physicians, there's hospitals, there's chiropractors, you know, there's PTs, there's everything. There's PTs, it, it's an oversaturated marketplace, okay? This is the current PT market and the current mindset of most P PT clinics, okay? They're still operating out of the old, old belief system. The norm is in standard PT. I need to see the patient three times a week for four weeks, okay? Um, they're staying in their old model. PT is always this way and it's always gonna end up being, being this way. We depend on physicians, okay? We're depending on ACOs and POPs and primary care physicians to refer us patients. And many people just focus on post-op rehab. Okay, and the public views us as just glorified personal trainers and we're just post-op rehab stuff. Many patients say, I didn't even know that I, that I could even come to you because I didn't have a surgery. Okay, so this is the old mindset. And this, this is the piece of the pie of what everyone's fighting for. Out of the whole healthcare market, most PTs are just targeting this small amount. And remember, if us new PTs don't stay proactive and adapt, we're gonna get crushed. Okay, if we don't tap into that bigger market, you may not be in business too much longer. So, you know, everyone has seen this picture on the left. It's probably, it's based off of the Virginia Mason study where they looked at direct access to physical therapy for lower back pain. Most people are still tracking that blue and that old, old approach where they get back pain, they see the doctors, then they see the specialists, then they get an imaging, then they follow up with the doctors, then they do PT. And you can see that it's more expensive, okay? And again, it's the old physical therapy mindset. You know, we're missing a huge chunk of the market and we're only tapping into 16%. Where do I get 16% from? These are examples of studies with low back pain showing that you know, when they get seen by a primary care physician, only 7% are getting referred out to physical therapy. Another study shows 16.3%. Initial physical therapy received by 13.1%. So physicians aren't really sending us patients in this example when they should be, okay? So, if we're gonna open a business in an oversaturated market, Okay, I love this Elon Musk quote. I pretty much have a man crush on Elon Musk. I think he's awesome, uh, even though his stock isn't doing too well right now. Um, but I think he's innovative and he's, I mean, geez, he's thinking about traveling to Mars and burrowing tunnels underneath LA to solve the traffic problem. I mean, that's pretty awesome. Um, but he says this quote, if you're gonna open a business in an oversaturated market with lots of competition, that's us, your service or product needs to be far superior than your competition. Not a little bit better, not great. It needs to be superior, okay? That's so crucial because someone's not gonna pay you cash if you're doing the same, excuse me, half-assed treatment 
and that standard care is doing. If you're doing the exact same stuff, they're not gonna pay you cash. If you're delivering the same service, you know, no one's gonna pay cash if you're gonna double and triple book them, okay? Your product has to be far superior than standard care, okay? So the question is, how are you gonna be different than your competition? If anyone wants to open up a business or go into business, you have to read this book, Blue Ocean Strategy. It is an awesome book. It'll help uh, you analyze your market and how what standard is and how you're gonna differentiate yourself from the standard. Um, this is a great <coughs> book that I highly recommend. And I, I love the term because um, they use the term value innovation, which means decrease the cost and increase the buyer value. I love that term value innovation. But if anyone's interested, that's an unbelievable book that I highly recommend you to read. So what, what market am I tapping in? Okay, this is the new cash-based physical therapy market, okay, where I deliver a superior experience compared to standard care. I do it better, okay? We deliver superior outcomes, and it's a new business model that's best for, for the patient, okay? We're tapping into that huge market. Now my competition is trainers, uh, sorry, personal trainers, athletic trainers, chiropractors, massage therapists, acupuncturists, physicians, hospitals, chiropractors. That's my competition now. It's not just physical therapy. I'm not chasing after that 16%, okay? I'm creating a whole new market. In uh, that book, they use an awesome example about Cirque du Soleil, where they took the theater market and the circus and looked at the, the, at the pros and cons of each one and morphed into a new market, Cirque du Soleil, and it took off. And it, it, it created a new untapped market with no competition and thrived and grew. They took the pros and cons of both of them and created their own market. I'm technically trying to create my own market. It's a little more saturated than having no competition. I just reached out to a whole bigger market, okay? Am I in the concierge medicine? market? Am I in the physical therapy one? Am I in the fitness? Am I in the healthcare market? I think it's a combination of everything. If you increase your, your market, then I only need a little bit of the market to be able to grow, uh, grow a business. A lot of cash-based PTs start out with the fitness. They're kind of taking over the fitness industry and their main competition is personal trainers and sport stuff, okay? And sport performance and stuff. A lot of PTs are tapping into um, more concierge where they they have a home home service model where they go to the patient's homes and treat them okay so their competition is more like a concierge medicine or even like a home health okay uh, my I'm kind of doing all of that together my goal is just to target anyone who's in pain in a certain market who's actively searching for pain and get them to call and come in so I'm a little bit I don't like doing the fitness stuff really I'm more Healthcare, I guess you could say, is my main thing. Um, so that's my market. But the point is, I'm creating a new market, so it's a bigger marketplace, so I can just attack a different part of the market share, okay? Um, so what is value? Everyone keeps saying, well, you have to create value, okay? These are just definitions of value. We're highly educated. We don't need to know that. But what can we learn from baseball cards, okay? I remember back in the day, collecting baseball cards, I used to have my... Frank Thomas, I had my Cal, Cal Ripken Jr. baseball cards, and I look up in a Beckett, and I'm like, oh man, my card's worth $100. Oh man, this Beckett says it's $78 and it's going up. <laughs> but is a baseball card really worth anything if no one's willing to buy it from you? So like, I have all my baseball cards sitting in a box that I don't even know if they're worth anything anymore. But it, it gets you thinking, just because you think it's valuable doesn't mean that someone else does, okay? Is a baseball card really worth anything if no one wants to buy it from you? So think about it, okay? So what, are, well, for, for one, are we really creating value for us as PTs? We're not, government advocacy, legislators don't know what we're doing. Our membership's down. Insurance companies don't value PT. The public and the patients don't even value PT. They don't even know about us. We did a horrible job of branding and we've done it <coughs> And we've done it to ourselves. It's not saying that we can't get there. You guys, the future of our profession, have to start doing this, okay? But we're not creating real value in anyone's eyes yet, okay? 
So if you want to learn some other business stuff, this is awesome. You ever seen this stuff on, uh, this guy's hilarious. He breaks down businesses from Starbucks problems to Tesla problems to uh, Facebook. Uh, it's valuetainment.com. And this is case studies with the biz doc. These guys are doing some great stuff. This guy and Patrick Bet David, he went to the Harvard Business School the um, executive Harvard chairman, which costs, I don't even know how much it costs, but it costs a lot of money, a lot of time to go do. And his project was to help entrepreneurs learn business strategies. So he created this. This was his business project during the Harvard executive training. Okay. Um, and I've had, I've known three people who actually gone to it and said it's the best investment ever. It just costs a lot of money to go do. Okay. But he says, he, I think he was doing the case study for Buffalo Wild Wings. A couple years back, Buffalo Wild Wings almost went out of business. And they were interviewing it, and uh, the owner of Buffalo Wild Wings blamed it on the public of why his business was, was not doing good. And uh, he said this statement, Tom Ellsworth, was he was analyzing the business. The customer is not the problem. The customer is moving forward. And you haven't changed it. You stayed here and the world just passed us by. And that's what we cannot do. We cannot stay here. We need to deliver what the public needs and wants. Okay, so we really have to un understand what the public wants and adapt to it. Okay, we can't just blame the public for not knowing what our brand is or what PT is. Okay, we have to adapt to what the public and what the patients need and want. So we need to adapt to the current market. We need to satisfy the needs of what our patients want. This is a great patient value formula. Let's keep it simple. Keep it simple, stupid. Going by the KISS principle, okay? The results and the quality of the customer experience. If results go up and the customer experience goes up, it creates more value, okay? If price goes up, okay, to a certain point, it's gonna decrease value. Okay, if the additional costs go up, it's gonna decrease value. You know, an example of other costs is like time loss. If I'm um, missing work, if I'm missing vacations and stuff like that, okay? So you wanna be able to decrease the work loss or the time loss or the inability to run or the inability to play football or the inability to go on vacation, okay? Keep it simple. If you wanna increase value, you wanna decrease price, decrease the time loss, increase results and increase the customer experience. The two most important things that patients want is the outcome and the patient experience. If you had to focus on anything, if you gave them a great patient experience, they'll pay cash for that. You know, some of my packages cost $3,000. Someone pays me $3,000 to fix their back pain. So if you create great outcomes and a great patient experience, people will pay you cash for your physical therapy treatment. So are, are we creating value? Uh, we need to really be innovative like, like Uber. We need to really start thinking like entrepreneurs like Mark Cuban, Elon Musk, when we solve healthcare problems. We really need to be cost effective like Amazon. We need to really create a new model or a new belief system for physiotherapists, okay, so we can thrive like Apple and Steve Jobs. So I left the slide there. There's lots of studies that show um, the cost effectiveness of physical therapy. There's lots of studies that show um, long-term and short-term outcomes compared to surgeries. <clears throat> um, there's lots of studies that show the benefits of direct access. So we, we have the research, okay? But the main thing that we need to focus on in marketing to the consumer or patients or to the public is really delivering great outcomes, a better experience, and cheaper costs. And that's how we're really going to deliver value, OK? Um, Les Brown has a great quote. Necessity doesn't fuel innovation. Refusing to accept things the way they are is the motor of innovation. We can't still do what PT used to do five or 10 years ago. We can't sit back and let the world pass us by, OK? We need to adapt. We need to start doing things in a new way and be innovative. If another, if you guys haven't read this book, whether you want to go into business or finance, uh, Rich Dad Poor Dad is a classic. If you just want to learn some basic finance, he puts it in such a fundamental way. That's a great book to look at. Um, and he has a quote saying, entrepreneurs have one thing in common, they keep going. No matter what changes, they're going to always 
reinvent the rules, but that's a great book right there for basic finance stuff. Even if you're not even gonna go into business, Rich Dad, Poor Dad's a great book. Um, so <clears throat> let's look at this. Hospitals and physicians are already adapting, okay? They're going into the ACO model. They're buying out clinics. You know, these huge ortho clinic groups are coming in and buying out practices. A lot of primary care physicians are going in the concierge model, okay, or a membership model where um, they're just trying to create 500 members and they have a monthly fee. My primary care physician is a uh, concierge practice. I just pay $120 a month for my family. And I can text her, I can, if my daughter has a rash, I can text it to her. If I have a question, I can call her. And all she wants is five, 500 members. And she's running her practice that way. I have a neighbor who has a concierge practice. He has a a la carte menu. Whenever you come and see him, you just pay this fee for this, this fee for that, and such. So um, physicians are adapting, OK? This is what my primary care physician says, um, which is f interesting stuff. In addition, if you insure your catastrophic events but not everyday expenses, like your car insurance, it doesn't include tire rotations, oil changes, or checkups. Your homeowner's insurance doesn't include painting, window washing, house cleaning. And you shouldn't rely on your insurance for primary care. Interesting. This is what they were saying to me. So they're already jumping ahead saying that health insurance isn't going to cover primary care visits anymore. And they, they're going to go a cash model and they think it's effective. Is physical therapy going to be like that? You know, almost to a point where your auto insurance doesn't cover your tire rotations, your oil changes. Are they not going to cover your physical therapy treatments for ankle sprains and stuff like that? And they're going to cover you for catastrophic events? This is where your HSA is going to come into a cash base. Therapy. I don't think physical therapy is going to reimbursement is not going to go up. It's going to be a long time until they see real value here. But we can tap into this HSA, and I think the future is for outpatient clinics to tap into this cash-based market. It doesn't have to be 100%. There's different models. You can go hybrid. You can go create some other programs that are cash-based or do a 100% cash-based clinic, kind of like me. But is physical therapy coverage going to be kind of like auto insurance going forward for outpatient stuff? Okay? It's something to think about. Dentists are, are adapting. Does anyone really need dental insurance anymore? Um, you know, so whenever I go to the dentist, I just pay, pay cash, okay? Uh, there, there's a lot of dentists who are going towards a cash-based model. Trainers are, are adapting. There's some trainers around Orlando who are already marketing post-op rehab, and they're doing rehab with patients after total knees and uh, ACLs, okay? They're corrective exercise specialists, whatever that means. Um, they're, they're doing FMS training. They're doing the TPI training. TPI is the Titus Performance Institute. FMS is the Functional Movement Screen. Okay, that's the same stuff that we're doing. So they're actually adapting, and they have no limitations in their practice act. They can just see them for whenever. I don't even know if they even have a practice act. It's just they have no limitations with anything. Okay, this is a whole nother scam. Pretty. <laughs> this is PIP and auto accident stuff. I'll just go over this really, really quick. Okay, so if someone gets in an auto accident, I feel bad for people in an auto accident because they go to a lawyer that they're funneling them into. They funnel them into a treatment clinic that is most likely no skilled PT there, maybe a chiropractor with some text. They bill the uh, PIP coverage, which is normally $10,000 um, for coverage. They bill it really quick in a month and then kick them out the door and they funnel you into pain, pain management. But the insurance won't cover them until they do pain management now or, or even a surgery. It's a big scam. I feel people need to be educated on this. You know, I see a lot of these patients, they, ca they find me online before they get forced into surgery and I get them better and no one's willing to pay f for their treatment. Because you know what, in the end, the higher the cost of the care goes up, the lawyer gets 33 and a third. Of the thing. So why would the lawyer want to get their patient better for two for two thousand dollars? This is stuff you you have to know, especially if you know anyone in an auto in an auto um, accident. You have to ask yourself where's the best treatment at, and don't just settle for a clinic of wherever they put you in. You have to know this stuff. Um, 
And I have multiple examples with that. Massage therapists are adapting. You know, they're doing myofascial releases for cash. You know, uh, they have one-to-one -one patient care. Who doesn't like a massage? They're doing Graston, instrument-assisted soft, soft tissue mobilization. They're doing cupping. Okay, they're doing myofascial releases. This is for you neuro people. There's a neuro recovery clinic in Orlando, Florida. It sees patients with stroke, TBI, spinal cord, MS, Parkinson's disease. It has gait assisted treadmill walking, functional e stem, locomotor training, weight bearing exercises, functional movements, and core strengthening. Doesn't hire a single PT. They're all exercise physiologists. And there's personal trainers and exercise specialists. That, that's, that's our stuff, okay? But they, they get around it because these people are paying cash to come and see them and there's no limitations because they don't have a PT there but they're doing but they're doing this stuff this is stuff we have to know chiropractors you know they're always constantly trying to change change their practice act they want more and more power they have a hundred percent membership so they have a lot of money a, a lot of lobby power um, they're excellent in in a business training they get patients to pay them thousands of dollars for a, for a treatment okay but we have to adapt to these current trends, okay? We need to, you know, skate to where the pucks are going on the future of physical therapy, and we need to adapt, because everyone else is adapting except us, okay? We need to deliver an exceptional customer service, okay? We need to implement a blue ocean strategy, solving problems and be more innovative, create a superior product, okay? Compared to our standard care and compared to our competition. We need to really think innovative. If you remember this old IAQ test about the dots and you had to draw like um, a lines without lifting your pencil um, to be able to connect the dots, we need to think outside the box here, okay? And really be innovative as a physical therapist to thrive in the future of healthcare, okay? We need to think outside the box. Is there a better way to do business? Yes, easily. Um, you know. Most people, I'm sure that you experience the same thing too. Like at some point w when you first started your business, you're probably like, what the hell am I doing? <laughs> it's hard, you know? And in life, and even whenever you're, you don't even have to open a business. When you push yourself to do great things, you're gonna feel that feeling like, what the hell am I doing? That's okay, okay? Whenever you do something great in life, you're always gonna have that feeling. You can't let fear and be scared um, or fear and being scared of doing things to stop you from accomplishing your uh, goals, okay? When I opened up my business, I was like, what the hell am I doing? This is crazy, okay? And I, for the first couple of years, I asked my, I'm like, man, am I doing, is this what I'm meant to do and stuff like that? You're always gonna have that stuff, okay? So whenever you push yourself beyond your comfort zone to, to accomplish something, you will always feel that feeling, that's okay. That's how, that's how you grow, because you'll learn from it and you'll adapt and you'll get smarter, stronger, and you'll learn from it, and then you'll move on to the next level and be able to like accomplish that stuff. So whether it's business or not, you'll always have doubts, okay? Um, another Tony Robbins quote, disappointment is inevitable when you're attempting to do something of great scale, okay? Instead of letting your disappointments drive you to find new answers, discipline your, your disappointments. Use fear as a motivator. It's a learning process, okay? Through each step of my business, I've always, was um, uh, scared and, uh, and I had doubt. And there were certain times throughout business that I was struggling. You know, I always use this, I always tell students this, as long as your families are God, family, work, you're gonna go down the right path. Because there was one point in my second year where I went work, family, God, and things just go wrong. But as long as your priorities are that way, you're, you'll overcome any disappointment, any fear, of failure, and you'll overcome everything that way. You just gotta keep your priorities straight. Um, so four principles to thrive in a cash-based practice and to create true value innovation, okay? You need to create cost effectiveness, okay? Um, and, and it goes back to my example. If it costs you know, $5,000 in standard healthcare and a chiropractor costs four, can you get that patient better for 2,000? Can you get them better for 2,500? You have to create cost effectiveness in a cash-based practice, okay? Because it's kind of, you know, who would you choose? 
it's a no-brainer. You'd probably come to Pursuit Fizzle there because I can get you better, faster, for cheaper. If you have to pay out of pocket, you know, you're going to go to the person that can get you better with the great outcomes for the cheapest cost. Okay? You have to create cost effectiveness. Okay? We need to do optimal patient targeting. Stop referring for passive streams of um, leads or referrals. You know, let's do, let's take advantage of some of the technology. Let's target our ideal market. Like when I first started, I wanted to treat runners with plantar fasciitis. I created marketing campaigns to target runners. I did guest lectures with running groups. I did seminars targeting runners, okay? Don't mar I don't market physical therapy. I market to niche markets or I market like hip pain treatment, lower back pain treatment, best treatment for shoulder pain. I just happen to be a physical therapist, okay? I'm trying to reach beyond that 16% of, of the market. I don't want people searching for physical therapy because they were probably in standard care already and they're in their insurance mindset because their physician, they walked into the doctor with low back pain, he told them that you have low back pain, gave them some meds and told them to go, go do phys physical therapy. But they want to use their insurance already. I want to, I, I want to target that person when they're searching online. Uh, what's the best way to treat back pain? You know, I want to target specifically. I'm not looking for brand, brand marketing, okay? Identify patients that you want to treat. Identify people that will best respond to physical therapy, okay? <clears throat> we need to create value in an oversaturated healthcare market, okay? Now you know the definition of value, what patients really care about, what patients want, and what patients need. And if if you solve those problems, you'll create true value in the uh, public's eyes, okay? So we need to create real, real value there, okay? We need to show superior outcomes and superior results. This is one of my mentors. I, I love all of his courses, and Jim even took some of them too. I remember um, him saying this, but don't we owe it to our patient to give them the best treatment possible? Don't we owe it to them to do what's best? That, like, when I was a new grad and he said that, it just clicked with me. I was like, man, we need to be doing this. Don't you owe it to, to your patients to do the best for them? Okay, so we need to show superior outcomes. You can't show the same outcomes compared to standard care. So it all comes back to what problems are we solving, you know, and are you creating real value in the public size? Because most people get scared just thinking about a cash-based practice. But you know, if those are the two m most important things, show great outcomes and give a great patient experience, um, and people will pay cash for your services. Um, you know, so just remember, in the public size, price is what you pay, value is what you get. So someone may end up paying $1,800 for their treatment with me, but what do they get? They get to enjoy their time. They get to be 70 years old and play tennis with 40 and 50 years old. Uh, 50 year old people, they get to enjoy their family time. They get to get back to surfing. They get to go run again without pain. They get to avoid surgery. So there's a difference of price and value and really identifying what your patients want. They're willing to pay cash for that. Now, the hardest thing is everyone wants to open up a business but not everyone's going to be successful. It all comes down to execution. And this is the biggest flaw of what like a lot of physical therapists run into. Everyone wants to open up a cash-based clinic. It's gonna be a huge trend going forward. You're seeing a lot of new grads that, uh, there's a lot of new grads that are following me opening clinics right out of school, okay? Um, it's a huge trend going forward, but just like the CrossFit industry, you know, there's gonna be a time where it's oversaturated and your business may or may or may not fail. There's a lot of CrossFit gyms that are going out of business because it's an oversaturated market too, okay? But everyone's gonna try to open one, but it doesn't mean that you're gonna be successful. So I know it's seven o'clock now. Um, that was the first half, and I, I'm not really planning on going over business marketing and sales stuff, but I'm open to staying around, answering questions. If anyone has questions now, I figure that we can spend the next couple minutes answering some stuff, going over some stuff. And if anyone afterwards, um, I'll be willing to stay and like go over some personal questions if you guys want. If you have any questions, I mean, 
Even if you're a neuro PT or a PEDS and you want some mentorship and you want to call me and ask, I'm willing to do whatever for this program. So if you guys have questions about stuff of where to go after school, residency or not, you can contact me. Um, it's really easy to find me online, um, whether it's Pursuit Physical Therapy or whether it's cash-based physical, th physical therapy dot org. Um, I'll be happy to mentor anyone here um, just as a way of giving back to the program. So I think you guys are an awesome program. I love how you still have the research component here and it's a great program to be a part of. So um, if you guys have questions, you guys can stick around. If anyone has questions right now, we can go over some stuff. I know that class is over at seven, but are there any questions at all? It's like, that's a lot of business, geez. But like, everyone's right, I mean, Right now, you guys are focused on your studies and passing your exams and stuff like that. But as you go through and you work in clinics and you'll see the stuff, you're like, man, that guy came and lectured to us. And he told me about that. I was like, they're trying to squeeze like three or four patients in my schedule within an hour and stuff. But um, if there is no questions, I'm not sure if you have to go over anything with them. But uh, um, feel free to reach out to me if anyone does have questions, whether it's a year or two from now or not. But I'm here to help if anyone has anything. Why did you do your residency? I did my residency at Florida Hospital. It was an orthopedic one. Um, I wanted to get good quick. So I knew I wanted to go into business, whether, you know, whether it was cash or private. I knew I wanted to get good quick. So after my first year working in a clinic, I had the opportunity to go to Florida and do it. So I was like, I'm in. So I took a pay cut. I did it. I got my OCS. Um, with time, you know, it's up to the, each clinician and their skill set will dictate whether they're good or not. I think that having a board certification helps me market to the public because if you were a patient and you wanted to see a general PT or a master's PT or a doctorate with a board certification, I think it's easily marketable. So I only hire a board certified specialist because it's part of my marketing strategy. Um, but you know, my uh, colleague has a master's. I think she's a better PT than I am. But she has her OCS and we've had the same training. So in the big picture, having a OCS or not doesn't matter. But I think, I believe that it's, you're better marketable to the public as being board certified. It's like, would you rather see a senior physician or a physician that does residency and fellowship and training MS and is board certified in the neuro? You know, it's like, it's a no brainer. So. I chose to do a residency because I just wanted to get good quick. The future of PT education, I think they're starting to push it towards a two-year academia and funnel you right, right into residency. Because right now you're, you're studying just to be an entry-level PT to, to pass your boards. I think that's bad for our profession because we're getting a bunch of average PTs out there. We need to really specialize and get good. We need superior outcomes. We can't um, be getting average PTs out there and then taking four or five years to get them as expert level. We need to almost specialize and hone in. Are you a neuro PT? Are you sport? Are you ortho? And then once you decide, then you go into that and get good because we need to show good, good outcomes. Okay. So any other questions? Perfect. You mind pressing that red button for me?